So, I think... <laughs> so, now it's on. Okay. Now I think it's time to start to with the second day of Puddle. I would like to welcome you again. And the first, uh, some technical information. So after some improvements on the website and so on and with Springer, so I noticed that morning that the proceedings are available. So you have to uh, click on the link which is in the, in the Puddle web pages and only to this link, if you click at the link, then you can download the proceedings, so the PDF and EPUB version. So. Okay, so, uh, but now for the first uh, session, so uh, I would like to welcome Robbie Findler here. He has accepted to be an invited speaker. So for the functional programming people, I do not need any introduction to Robbie because he's well known there. But as I mentioned yesterday, so we here is uh, where we join also with logic programming communities and other. Therefore, I would like to give a short introduction about uh, Robbie. So uh, he has uh, received his PhD in 2002 at Rice University under the guidance of Matthias Felleisen. And then he worked a long time with him. So he also then moved here to Boston and now he's in Northwestern University. And uh, in his PhD, he worked on, on contracts, higher order contracts, and this was also awarded by ICFP, I think in 2012. So, and uh, yeah, and he's also well known for his work on, on Racket and Dr. Racket. And I think uh, maybe some of you has used it also as me in introductionary courses, which are a great system for teaching, for teaching logic, uh, teaching logic for teaching programming in general of course you can also use it and adapt it to different other languages and uh, yeah this was also awarded by by Zigplan as a Zigplan software award I learned so uh, because it's really a great development and yeah and today he will talk also I guess a little bit also it's not mentioned in the title Dr. Racket but he will also say us something about Dr. Racket and how to do modern macros with it. So, welcome here. Maybe is it working now? Yes, I think it is. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. So deep in uh, in a modern macro system, there's some imperative bits. Mm, okay. We won't talk too much about those, but they're there. My apologies in advance. Maybe you can take this as a challenge, but if not, at least you have my apology about it. Uh, the second thing is that many invited keynotes are kind of these light, airy things that uh, sort of give you this high-level thing, and you can kind of check your email in the middle and it's going to be fine. This talk is a little bit more technical. So um, with that in mind, I, the background required is just some understanding of programming languages generally. You should be able to follow the talk fine. Um, so, but if you miss something or I don't say something because uh, it's just sort of obvious to me and I forget to mention it, but it's weird because of all the parentheses or something like that, just, you know, just say something, stop me, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain it. Raise your hand if you feel more comfortable that way. That's all fine. OK. So, uh, so with that, uh, let me start with the thesis of the talk. Okay. Modern macros are an open compiler. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> That's maybe a little bit opaque. So let me take a few minutes to explain what the thesis is, and then hopefully you'll remember it as sort of a slogan for what I'm trying to convince you of today. Um, how many of you, when I say macros, think of uh, hash define or CPP or M4, any, anybody? Yeah, 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 okay. This is the wrong headspace to be in for today, okay? These, these things, it's like the programmer writes one program, some tool comes in, changes it into a different program, and then the programming language gets involved. 
That's not what, instead, we should think of the, this is like dates back to the mid 50s. We want to like, let's skip forward a little bit to um, 1963 uh, and think of this as kind of the root of the modern macro system. And this is a, like a two page memo, an AIM memo where, but one of the things that's, that's essential in what's written here is that the macros are part of the programming language. Okay. So uh, how many of you have heard of hygiene? In, in context of math. Okay, good, good. This is a technically deep, challenging paper that I've heard people describe as um, they fixed alpha equivalents for macros, which is not wrong. That's a reasonable understanding. But what I want to emphasize is that this, this result, if you haven't read the paper and understood what's really going on, it's non-trivial what's going on in there. And there have been five sort of major steps forward from that 1963 paper that lead us to where modern macros are today. So if you know something about hygiene and you have some intuition about what's going on in 1986, well, we could do the kind of historical thing to catch you up to the current, the present, but that's maybe the long way round. And instead, um, what I would like you to do, if you'll indulge me, is to instead sort of orient yourself around thinking about compilers. So here's a cartoon of a compiler architecture um, like a compiler architecture diagram cartoon, where we have the parser, which takes your linear sequence of bytes and turns it into a tree. We have the front end, which simplifies like a lot of human conveniences away into the IR, where the compiler community for the large part lives. And we like lots of fun optimization, interesting things happen here. And then we generate some assembly so it can run the program. Okay. In this context, modern macros are, they're not an open entire compiler. They're an open front end to the compiler. So let's focus in on what's going on in the, in the front end for a moment. So in, in the front end, you have some monolithic recursive function that translates just the parsed form down into that IR language. And what a modern macro system offers to you is the idea that this monolithic take it or leave it thing is not flexible enough, not composable enough to be able to easily build new programming languages. And instead, aspirationally, okay, what we want to think about is that each of these is an independent component that we can somehow take or leave. And that that's how we're going to build a new front end to our compiler and get a new programming language. So very much in the spirit of LLVM, where you put a new front end in, you can reuse all that good stuff that's happening in the middle end. And, and um, here, we want to say, okay, we want to take that one step further, where we want to be able to sort of mix and match cases Whatever that means, okay? Just take this as aspirationally for now. We're going to dig into that and understand what that means as we go through the talk. But just imagine, you know, I could take like a couple of constructs in some programming language that's already there, put them together with a couple of constructs that are sort of different, maybe throw away a few that don't make sense for the particular language I'm building, and get a new front end and then a new entire programming language out of it. Okay? Um, let me just, before we get into like how we're going to achieve that technically, um, let me just show you some programming languages that we have in Racket, which is an instance of a modern macro system, um, and just to give you a feel for the sort of space of possibilities. Okay, so uh, anybody know uh, synchronous reactive programming? Esterel? Yeah, you heard of it? Uh, okay, a little bit? Okay, so there's a, there's a language in that family, in that community called uh, Reactive ML. This is, could be named Reactive Racket. So it, it has a, it's a programming language that has a notion of instance and channels and emission and parallel composition and all the stuff that you get with synchronous reactive programming. But it's, it's so the semantics is really quite different than what you would expect in, uh, you know, this is not like racket. Okay, there's a lot of parentheses here, but the semantics of this programming language is quite different than what it is. And so that's one. Here's, here's another programming language. This, this programming language was implemented by Sorowi, who's a PhD student at the University of Washington. I'll return to him later in the talk. Um, and he was studying Gödel's recursive functions in some math textbook. And of course, there's a programming language hiding inside there. So he implemented it and added it using the same techniques. So this, again, is running inside Racket, um, inside the, using the, back, the middle end and back end of Racket. And op through the open front end, we're now doing, I don't know, some, some factorial functions using Gödel recursive functions. Um, you recognize this programming language? Does this look familiar at all? Um, anybody who's taught introductory programming knows that every professional programming language is full of gaping pit holes, pitfalls for, uh, uh, for beginning students, right? There's just lots of stuff in there that, that's designed to make the professional's life work well, and students just fall into these things, and uh, it's terrible. So this is a programming language 
that has the same surface syntax as Python, but throws away a bunch of the things that lead to these pitfalls and adds a bunch of stuff in. And it's used in the uh, data structures and algorithms course at Northwestern University. So it adds a bunch of stuff in to be able to study the kinds of things that they want to be able to teach there. And then throws away a bunch of stuff that they don't need and that therefore lets them kind of place helpful error messages in place of those things they weren't using. Um, and just because we're at Paddle, there's a, data, there's a data log in here too, yay. Okay, I don't need to tell you guys about that one. Um, all right, so that's, that's, that's some of the things that you can do with this idea of having an open front end and getting, and these are relatively inexpensive to implement. I mean, it's still a programming language, you know, there's still work required there. But because of the ability to kind of mix and match cases here in this compiler, um, in the front end, you can get a lot of reuse when you're implementing these languages. Okay, so there are sort of uh, three things that we need to talk about, technical things that we need to talk about to see how to achieve this open compiler and get it to work. There's the control issues here in this uh, interesting recursive function. There's data issues here, and then there's sort of a dependency management picture, which I'll motivate as we go. So let's start with control. So if, uh, if someone passes in an expression, and uh, maybe it's an if expression, so we go in that first case, and then maybe a sub-expression of that's an and expression, and you can see like and expressions are really just a shorthand for a ternary if, so we're gonna go back around and, and, and that one, and then maybe there's a let expression inside there, and there's, so there's a lot of sort of things happening in the way this function is doing its job that we need to tease out and think about as um, how the modern macro system can help us automate some of this and leave us just the space to put in the parts that are interesting and different about our programming language. So here's an enumeration. We have to, as we work through, we have to identify the next case. We have to find the transformation for that particular case. There's, uh, you can see that these recursive calls are kind of inside the boxes. So there's some kind of a recursion happening through these things in some way. And it's not happening in an arbitrary way, it's actually happening in a very structured way. So we're not going to give that uh, uh, operation to the person who's writing the content of the boxes. That's gonna be happening automatically for them, that sort of recursive driver. Um, anyone who's written a front end to a compiler knows that sometimes you have constructs where some outer thing that the programmer has written affects the compilation of some inner thing, like syntactically inside, right? And so we need some way to facilitate communication. There's typically like, you know, some environment, some accumulator parameter that's carrying some information about the context in, so that it affects compilation for nested things. So that's the, the uh, we need to do, we need to do something to help support that. And then this last point here, um, it's sort of obvious when you think about it from the perspective of a compiler and the front end to a compiler, but when you start to get into the specific cases in a macro, it can be easy to forget. And that is, there's only one way, there's only really one thing you can do with a program that came out of the parser when you're on your way to the middle end, and that is transform it into the middle end language. Right? You, you, it's like a totally different language out there. We don't know anything about what's happening in these sub-expressions. These guys are supposed to communicate with each other, but we're supposed to have our focus on one component and implementing one component. So what the sub-expressions are gonna do in a particular case, well, it's like, well, they do whatever the language is gonna do. The only thing you can really do with them is just transform them into that well-known language and then maybe look at that. So you don't know anything somehow about what all the other macros are doing. And that's kind of key in the way the macro system composition is happening. If you're gonna take four of these and add three more and drop seven of them, you, you know, whatever, what's, le what's left? Well, I don't know, you know, you just expand it into the, into, the, uh, into the middle end IR language and find out what that program does. There's not any declarations about what it's doing. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. We will come to error reporting on these things for sure. So, but, but when your perspective is in just one case, then you sort of don't know, and you're implementing that one case to be reused maybe in multiple languages, you sort of don't know where you're being used. So that's the sense with which I mean, sort of the, the, this, tra this overall transformation is, uh, you don't know which one you're in the context of. Right? You, so you don't have any information about that. All, all you can really do is, is go do the transformation, or fail to do the transformation. Okay, so the expander, is the tool that handles all this, handles all that stuff. So expand, uh, we give it a high level program, something that just came out of the parser. 
We give it an environment, that's the gamma. That gamma is also going to have the macros that are active as we're doing this expansion. Oh, I didn't say. Each of these, each of these boxes, OK, maybe you kind of intuited that already. They, these are macro definitions. These are going to be the macro definitions, each of these boxes. OK? All right, so we'll initially have, um, we'll initially have like sort of a set of global macros that are in this environment. And we'll also use it. We'll also use this environment to help facilitate communication. So it'll play two roles here. And then we get back a program that's fully it's in, the, in the IR. Thank you. <laughs> the, the, OK, so there's three interesting cases um, here. First case, we found a macro. So we have some expression where there's an identifier right after an open paren. And that identifier is in the domain of gamma. And we look it up and we find a function, some function there. So, OK, that's the transformation. And now, this is going to be an arbitrary racket function. right? It can just do whatever it wants to do. And then it's going to transform this expression. So we'll take this expression and give it to it. And then we'll just start the expansion process over again with whatever it produces. So this is like the, we, we're actually doing one of the cases now. And we found it because we looked, it up, we looked up this name in the environment. Um, this can also happen if uh, we encounter a name that's bound in the environment that's not immediately following an open paren. So it's somewhere else in an expression, not immediately following. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to make it clear the sort of two levels here. There's a, there, yeah. This, this thing right here is, think of this like a tree. OK, this thing is a tree where we have uh, some, some, some sequence of stuff and an identifier in the first subchild of the tree. And then this thing is a tree that's a leaf node. <laughs> So we take that tree and we pass it into this function we got out of the environment. It gives us back a new thing. It does a transformation. Then we just continue on with that. Yep. Um, so these functions are arbitrary code written in Racket. Racket's an imperative programming language. So one thing they can do is they can communicate with each other through some kind of global state. This sounds like a terrible idea. Um, there's actually some management of the state that's, act, that's available to these functions that makes that not such a terrible idea in some situations. And uh, I'm not going to explain sort of the setup to know how that works, but just know that that's not always a terrible idea. Um, so that's, but that's one way that these functions can communicate with each other and cooperate. But the, ex the expander explicitly facilitates two other ways to do it. So let me just tell you what those are. Um, you can introspect on gamma. So, um, this, this racket function that you have here, there's a primitive in racket called syntax local value. And the expander is kind of cooperating behind the scenes with that function syntax local value, where if you give it an identifier, it just looks it up in the gamma and gives you the value back in the gamma. So that's how you can retrieve information that some outer thing has put for you. OK, we haven't seen how to put information in yet. But if it gets put in, you can look it up in this gamma okay, that the expander is man maintaining as it works through the term. The other thing you can do is related to that sort of point I stressed earlier. Um, if, if you have some sub-expression that, you're, that you're, responsible for transfer, you're, you're responsible for transforming some form, and there's a particular sub-expression in it, you can ask that that be fully expanded and then sort of into the IR, and then, which is a well-known language, and then you can kind of look at it and do stuff. And that might affect how you choose to make other compilations. And so, you can, so in other words, you can sort of invoke a sort of recursive expansion, entire expansion process on a sub-expression um, as part of this transformation. And then use that, what you get, information you get out of that to decide how to do the overall transformation that you're being asked to do for this particular form here. So those are the two ways that the expander facilitates uh, cooperation between these functions. Um, OK. Case two, we found a macro definition. So the way you write a macro definition is you say let syntax, then you put the name of the macro, then you put the, the function that does the transformation, and then you, um, the transformation will then be active inside this expression. So it's like a local macro. So we, we, we seed gamma with some kind of global macros, and then as we're doing the expansion process, we might encounter some macros that are only being used in part of the term, and then that's how we add things to gamma. OK. now. <laughs> Uh, I want to call your attention to this eval here. Um, we're going to return to this eval because there's some subtle points to be said here. But this is like a tree, right? This is a term we're processing that's an input to the expander. So we need to actually turn it into a real value that's a function we can do some 
we could call later if it was a macro transformer. So that's what this eval is doing. It's taking that tree and making an actual value that we can sort of use as part of the expansion process. Um, and uh, this value doesn't have to be a function because it might only be used with that syntax local value. So this is the way that you can put stuff that you might look up later about your context that other macros can then look up and then use. And uh, this, this probably seems a little bit opaque, but maybe just for the moment understand it as a possible thing you can do. And I'll show you some programming languages and point back to this to see why you want to do that later. Okay? <coughs> This is, this, is the, this is the main reason we need to return to this eval. So let me finish the three cases of the expander, and then, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, very good, very good. All right. Best question. Okay, you win the best question award today. Um, okay, so, so uh, uh, then the final case is you found a core form. So it's not a macro definition. We're not introducing a local macro. So the only things that are left are things in this well-known IR language. And the expander knows that language. So it knows how to recur inside. So this is just one example, if, but there's, I don't know, there's like eight or 10 examples, uh, eight or 10 things that are um, in the racket version that are the core forms. And, it, and based on the structure of whatever this core language is, it just sort of like, okay, I'm gonna do the recursion at this point and recur inside. So those are the, those are the three cases of the expander. Okay, so that's the control story. Let's talk about data. Yeah. Are you all the, core the core things are in this well-known published language that if you look in the racket docs, it's called the fully expanded form. It plays the same role as the IR in LLVM. It's like this well-known language that everything is compiling into. Yeah. So the expander has to know what that language actually is to be able to do that. So yeah. And actually, Michael Ballantyne, who I wanted to put some a comment. So you're giving this question is giving me an opportunity to mention him. I wanted to like put in a particular paper that he's worked on his, his work. Uh, where sometimes you want to be able to like temporarily change what the IR is, uh, and he has a, a very nice way of doing that. But uh, we, okay, in an hour I couldn't get there. Um, but anyway, that, that, that's that's good stuff. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about this argument now. But like, what's its type? What's the data structure? Because this argument is going to be used by each of these cases, right? Each one's going to get one of those things in and expected to produce one of those things out. So there's some interesting stuff to, to, to handle in that data structure. And let me focus your attention on this case. So this is a, the OR macro is like a classic macro uh, for, for reasons that will become clear in just a moment here. So um, we're in a truthy language. So everything that's not false, you know, takes the then branch in an if expression. And uh, we want a short circuiting OR. So if that's what your language has, then you have no choice but to introduce a local variable. And furthermore, you have no choice but to put that local variable around one of the sub-expressions. Okay. Which I'm sure red flags are going off for all, right? These are arbitrary expressions, A and B here. And now I just stuck an X around B. Oops. Right? So there's some issues there. Okay, you could say, fine, no problem. Just, this is arbitrary racket code. Just generate a fresh name here. Right? That's, that's all you really need to do to handle this situation. In fact, Clojure has a macro system where you just put like a hash on the end of the identifier and then Clojure will go generate that fresh name for you when it sees a hash. But there's a problem with this way of doing things. First of all, from a software engineering point of view, it's the wrong default. You shouldn't do something special to avoid capture. You should do something special to get capture, right? So you, you want capture, you don't want capture most of the time. So you want to just write stuff like this and have the right thing happen. That's one. The second point is a little more technical. There's this, um, you can write a macro that expands into another macro. And when you write such macros, it becomes really non-trivial to understand when you should be doing the generation of the fresh names. Because if the macro is going to expand into another macro, there's the moment at which it does the first expansion, which is maybe the right time to generate the fresh name. And there's the moment at which it's doing that generated expansion in the second one. Maybe that's the right moment to do the fresh name. Or maybe both or, you know, it's, it's, it gets complex. So what you really want is something, a data structure that just manages all the name generation and, uh, and, and you don't have to do anything about it as long as you don't want capture. Okay, so that's what this, that's what this data structure is going to be about. That, all right. So um, in order to explain it, I have to, it takes a few moments to explain this data structure. So here's two example, um, they're called syntax objects. Here, here are two example syntax objects. And 
Um, Racket has parentheses, and it's because of the macro system and because of these syntax objects that the parentheses are, are there in some sense. It's not because we love parentheses, although we do. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's really to help you see what's going on in your macro transformations. So when you look at this, you can see a definition of x, but you can also see a tree. So you see parentheses, therefore it's an interior node. Then you see it has three children, and these three children do not have parentheses, therefore they're leaf nodes. So you can see this is a tree, right? And the sort of mapping between the syntax and the trees are very clear. And that's the trees that the syntax objects are going to have. So the second one is the same thing. It's also a pair of parentheses with three things inside. So therefore it's an interior node with three children. And at, like here, the first child is a leaf. But here, the second child is not a leaf. It's got you know, some more stuff. And the square brackets are the same thing as parentheses. It's just, it's just another interior node here. OK? Um, so scope, let's talk scope. So if you're like me, you were taught variable names are not really relevant for the compiler or implementing your programming language. What's relevant are the arrows. The names are just there for the humans. And what we really care about is that these, this arrow is somehow really the essence of what's happening with scope. The syntax objects do not represent scope using arrows like this. Instead, they represent them another way, regions, and you can, we're going to recover the arrows from the regions. Okay, so that's the game. I'm going to explain the, how these regions work and then show you how you recover the arrows, which are really the essence of scope, um, these, these, these links, uh, using the, the regions. Okay. So we call the regions scopes because that's like, okay. So this, this is the red scope. And then inside that, there's the blue scope. And then inside that, there's the yellow scope. And you can see that um, this, the blue, this let operator is not a recursive thing because it's not blue here. Right? So you can see the kind of scope structure of this. Um, this picture is a little bit confusing, though, because it's sort of a three-dimensional picture. Right? There's like the red thing is kind of behind the blue thing is behind the yellow thing. So instead of drawing it like that, I'm going to collect all the entire set of scopes that each leaf node is in, it's a cocktail hour, and uh, I'm put them, write them on the leaf nodes. Okay. And I've left the, the boxes here for now, just so you can sort of see where things come from. Um, but the, the boxes are not, they're not really relevant, okay? And let me erase them. So these are the set of scopes that each leaf node is in. And, and actually, every, every sub-expression, even the interior nodes, have sets of scopes associated with them. It just, it's clutter in the diagram. So I'm just going to draw them on the leaf nodes. OK, so this is what the data structure has. So if we look at this x, oh, so if we look at this arrow here, how can we recover this arrow from the in, this information in the data structure? Well, this x down here is in the set of scopes red, blue, yellow. And the binder that we want is in the set of scopes red, blue. So that's the basic rule we're going to use. If the set of scopes on the binder is a subset of the set of scopes on the reference, then it binds. OK? How do we know it's on the binder? Oh, uh, OK, sorry, right. Two other things to say. You know, there, you know it's a binder. Take, OK, sorry. You don't actually need to care. Um, you, you can just take one that's the. That's, that's a subset. It's, it has to be in a binding position. Um, and for this talk, it's OK if it's always outside, nested. Yeah, yeah, this, this is in the IR. So we're going to be able to, we only need to do this once we have the IR. Okay. Actually, there's a, a little bit more, which we're going to get to here in just a moment. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you, you need to know it's in a binding position. So you need to know it's in the IR in order to do this, to, to determine this thing. Um, the reference, you just, you don't, you don't need to know, okay? There's more to say there, but it's confusing, okay? But just, let's take this as truth for the moment, okay? Um, because, because macros are arbitrary, you know, it's like an arbitrary function, so it can do weird things like duplicate this x into a binding and a, okay? So there's, there's weird things that can also happen here, but for now, let's just say, uh, you know, we know it's a binding occurrence because it's in the IR, and this is the this is a place where binding occurrences are in the IR. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's the next slide. Yes. We're, is that what you were going to say? Yeah. 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 So how would we know that? So we don't. We don't. That's right. We don't actually know that this is 
we only know this is going to happen because we, we're taking a little bit of information up into account about what OR is going to do, namely that it's going to put this in a, in a eventually in the I, fully IR in a reference position. Oh, so we couldn't do this without knowing what OR is. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so you have to do this after the, you, this, this, the process of putting the scopes in and then resolving the arrows, resolving the arrows has to happen only in the IR, and the process of putting the scopes in so the right resolution happens is through the macro expansion process. Okay. No, yeah, 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 good. No, no, I'm very happy to. So, so uh, So I haven't said how the scopes get put in yet. I, I, I'll say that in a, in a few minutes. Okay, okay, good. All right, so let's, uh, let's get this, this question. Like, wait a minute, red is a subset of red, blue, yellow. <laughs> okay, what about that one? Um, well, red is a subset of red, blue. So let me refine the rule just a little bit which is we use the subset, we use the largest subset that's in a binding position. So this one is a larger subset than this one of the reference, so therefore it's the one that gets the arrow. Okay, Does that, that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Um, and now, uh, now let's talk about how this, yeah. They, uh, so the way the expansion algorithm happens, you're always working from the outside in. So you always have some frontier kind of that's unexpanded code, and everything outside is uh, IR code. Yeah, so that's how you know. Um, so, yeah, and that's exactly, so that's the moment exactly when the scopes get put on by the expander. So when the expander sees an IR form, and that IR form introduces a variable binding, it generates a new scope puts that scope on the binder, so it puts the scope on the define, on the let, and then it also puts the scope on the, sub, on the part of the tree where the references are allowed to be. So in, in, for a let, it would put it everywhere down here. For the define, it's gonna put it everywhere, like that. Okay, that's, that's one, so I didn't show that in the expander algorithm because we weren't ready yet to talk about the syntax objects, but in addition, when it sees a fully expanded form, it puts scopes on. To, and that's how we get actually all the colors that are here. Now there's one other time it has to put scopes on, and that's when it does a transformation. So the scopes, so this or macro, it's the same one we saw before, this, this is what it's gonna do, okay? So this is the let that we saw before, and the rule that the expander follows is everything that's in the output of the expander, output of that expansion step, that was not in the input, gets a fresh scope. That's the rule. So that's all the green stuff here. So the Y and the X were in the input, so they don't get the new scope. But this let, th these three X's and this if were not in the input, therefore they get the new scope. Okay, so there's a data structure problem hand, hiding inside here, right? We have to do this, this we, wanna do, uh, we wanna do this operation of, you know, put a scope on an entire subtree, and we wanna do this kind of diffing operation thing. So um, there's more to say about the actual data structure that we're not gonna get into, but just, for, believe me that there are, these are effectively constant time operations. You can just do those two things to this data structure. Yeah. Is it relevant to ask how they connect to IO or E uh, or Y uh, macro language? I don't know these. <laughs> I'm sorry. So let's, maybe you, you can uh, help me later. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like uh, So so you, you you can No, no, no. This this x was not in the input. If they kind of copied this x over and put it here, then yes, you wouldn't put green. But they made a new x and they put that and that and that new so that's why it got a green. It's a new x. It's a different x. There's an interesting uh, complex uh, representation in, you know, it's a data structure and algorithm question you're asking me. And uh, that, that was the last paper uh, in that list of five papers. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and actually the third paper had a different version of it that used a more complex data structure that didn't work as well. Or, well, actually worked as well, but it was more complex. So that, that's like, 
multiple talks in its own to fully explain what's going on. But for, like, if you get the intuition of like, if I stuck some new code in my transformer, that's gonna get the scope, and if I just picked up something from my input and dropped in my output, that's not gonna get the new scope. You can think about it like pointer identity or something like that if you wanna think about it at that, at that level. Then, uh, then we're good, okay? That's all we need for, that's all you need to become a modern macro programmer. And if you wanna go beyond that to become a modern macro researcher, well, okay, read the papers, yeah, yes. Yeah, you can think of it like, 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 yeah, or, or like, just think of it like pointer identity of the of the value that came in somehow or something like that. No, no, it looks at the input and output. It's actually comparing the inputs and outputs, and it's doing something more complex and. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's not let's not let's not go. I mean, you you get you get that these are supposed to be green and these are not. So like, let's let's leave it there for now. Okay. That's that's essential. That's essential. That that there that it picks a fresh color to put on the new stuff. So when you stick some new code in, you're going to get a fresh color. That's the whole point of the slide. Yeah. And and the, and the reason we do that is because look. Okay, <laughs> I was like a change here. Didn't it? Green is not a subset of red, blue, yellow. So therefore we don't capture, right? That's kind of the whole point. So this arrow is still preserved, even though somebody accidentally, uh, unluckily chose, chose a name, right? And this is how the scopes are managed. Uh, this is how the, the, the binding structure is managed for you correctly. Okay, so here's the, here's the actual data structure kind of inductively. Um, I don't want to, I'm not going to talk about this too much, but there's a, one thing to talk about is this, syntax objects are a triple of the set of scopes and then the tree structure and then uh, this properties. So it's, it's very convenient to be able to kind of have a key value store stuck with every sub expression inside a tree when you're writing a compiler. Okay, so that, that's there in, in here. So it's got things like source location information for every sub expression stuck here. Yeah. It's a set. Yes, yes. They're really sets. Yes. So, th so I wrote the red, blue, yellow, but it, you know, blue, red, yellow is the same thing. It, it's a set, so there is no order. Like it's really a set in the data structure in the implementation. If you did, I think. Someone much smarter about macros than me had a nice long discussion with the person who worked out set of scopes. I think that was Michael Ballantyne with Matthew Flat, and whether list of scopes could do a thing because it would change certain, and like there's something there, uh, maybe, <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right, uh, so of course, working directly with this inductive data structure is, is terrible, okay? Um, and instead, uh, what we work with is uh, there's sort of two higher level things built on top of this. One that's like a pattern matcher to pull it apart, and the other one is a way to build new, um, new, da new data structures. So let me show you a function, and, and this is some racket code, so I'm not expecting you to be familiar with and read this code, so we're gonna read it together kind of slowly, okay? And then we'll look back at it again because it's got an interesting point to answer. Finally, Leonard's the best question in the talk. Okay, so let's just, let's just go through the code. So uh, define, that means we're defining a function, okay? The name of the function is transform or, and we know it's a function because of those parens were there. And we know that the function has one argument because there's one thing written here. Uh, okay, this is not subtraction. If you want subtraction in racket, you need more parentheses and spaces, okay? This is just, it's, a, it's in the middle of the name. All right, don't be confused. Okay, the first thing the function does is it uses syntax parse, which is the name of the pattern matching construct. Um, the first thing you give syntax parse is the tree that you want to destructure. And then what you put is the pattern. And these, are, these two arrows are pointing at the pattern. So look at the bottom one first. So this is a pattern with a pair of parentheses, interior node. It's got three things inside, so therefore there must be three children. So the pattern match will fail unless this syntax object is passed in and has that shape exactly. And actually, the syntax parse is one of the really nice declarative aspects of, uh, of uh, Racket's modern macro system. And that's what these colon expert thingies here, they're sort of declarations that help syntax parse give good error messages. So syntax parse has this much more sophisticated pattern language, and if you give it something that's like a close match but not exactly a match, 
then it actually synthesizes a really nice syntax error message for you automatically and, and, and signals that error message. Um, but, but for now, oh, we'll just look at these two things. Oh, and because we put hash clone literals or here, that means that this thing is a leaf node that is the identifier or. And because there is no such declaration for these two, these can be arbitrary trees. And furthermore, these are going to be variables that are bound. Yeah? I'm going to leave that question for Ryan Culpepper. Is, let's, let's file this under horrible hack that looks nice when you uh, write code. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> I, shouldn't, I, should, I should get some of the blame for that one too because of, <laughs> of Redux. But okay, um, all right, so then that's the, now this is the body. So there's just an arbitrary expression here. This might look like a let to you, but it's not a let because it's prefixed with hash quote. And so therefore, this is a syntax object. So this is now a tree with the three interior nodes. We went through that before. Okay? So this, this is the thing that we're returning. This is the data structure that we're returning. It just has a nice notation for writing these transformations, that data structure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can write hash back quote. Uh, I just didn't. No, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so OK, right. Exactly. You anticipate the next slide. Um, the, the syntax parse and hash quote cooperate with each other so that variables bound by patterns and syntax parse are looked up by uh, occurrences inside hash quote. So if you, if you bound it not with, if you bound E1 not with syntax parse, you would need to use hash comma to get it. But because it's bound with syntax parse, then these guys are just, you just can drop it in. It doesn't literally do that, but yes. So, so it turns out that syntax parse is a macro. <laughs> and it's using all of these goodies we're doing to not have to literally do what you described. Like the gamma is involved here. Okay, but I'm not gonna, okay, let's, let's yeah. Is, is colon expert, or rather expert, is that the, this, the pattern language? Or yes. Uh, expert is actually um, something that syntax parse defines that helps it do the parsing here. It, it, it means reject certain things. So if you left it out, it wouldn't reject those things. <laughs> uh, like keywords. There's, a, and it, okay. there's more stuff in the syntax and it rejects those things. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, keywords, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so what about that eval? <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, sidebar, uh, this let syntax that we talked about before, the, we're going to use, I'm going to use define syntax from now on. The only really difference between these two and the way they're treated by the expander is that body E, you have to go find the end of body E and put a close parent when you're using let syntax. Whereas with define syntax, it just kind of goes to the end of the file, basically. It it's actually it does more stuff than that. But like for us today, it's okay to just say, oh, it's just going to kind of keep going. So the body E, you just, so the basic difference here is that the body E, you don't have to go find the body E and put the close paren at the end of it, okay? That's, so we're still going to take this identifier and put it in the environment. We're still going to evaluate proc E, and then, and then the expander is just going to kind of continue with what's below. Okay, the actual thing it does is more complex because there's some support for mutual recursion, and, and, then, and there's actually more things in that data structure I showed you to support them, and that's where some of the imperative stuff is hiding, and we're not going to go there today. Okay, but, so define syntax. Um, so if we take this function we just like painstakingly went through to understand that code and we just changed the define into define syntax, we have a macro. Okay, there's a little bit of a, a shorthand happening here, this kind of function shorthand. I'm sure you can guess what this is short for. Um, it's, it's define syntax, the name of the function, and then a lambda. So now it looks like the define syntax, it looks like that case in the expander. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this thing into the environment, uh, mapped to evaluating this thing. Of course, when you evaluate a lambda expression, there's not a lot of interesting computation that happens there. But <laughs> there is some very interesting questions about the free variables of this lambda. And that's where we get to the third technical piece. Um, so this syntax parse now, that is, we need the implementation of that 
at compile time of this code, right? So we need the, which it's in the syntax slash parse library. But if you think about what we need at runtime, well, we're just using let and if here. So at runtime of this file, we just need the basics. So the this is where the module system comes in. It actually tracks the dependencies at compile time so that we can know what libraries we need at compile time and what libraries we need at runtime. But it's a little bit worse than that because as I pointed out, syntax parse is itself a macro. So there's the compile time of the compile time involved here. So the, the, the module system is, man is basically a dependency management system that can track this kind of towers of compile times. Okay? And just for fun, um, I, got, I took the implementation of Dr. Racket, which is Racket's IDE, and I wrote a script that finds com the deepest compile time of the compile time of the compile time tower I could. And here's uh, five layers. So Dr. Racket, that's runtime. The image is library. So I don't know if you noticed this here, uh, in, in, but if you look at these like, little things up here, I don't know, there's some like, nice shading and interesting shapes happening. Oh, you can't see the mouse. But like, there's some nice shading and interesting things happening on those buttons up there. Okay, that's because there's a ray tracer running at, c at compile time. <laughs> so the argument to the macro is not like some expression. The argument to the macro is a description of shapes and light sources and stuff. And the macro runs this arbitrary racket code to generate the bytes of a bitmap. So that's happening at, at compile time of Dr. Racket. Of course, that's written in typed racket in order to try to get the performance. So we need, at that compile time, we need the type checker. Um, typed racket is, of course, using syntax parse, so we need that, that macro at that compile time. And then, of course, syntax parse is written using racket, so we need like the basic stuff to be able to you know, actually go into those low-level um, inductive data structure operations. Uh, at, okay. And actually, this is, a, a, this is only the five that I felt like I could explain to y'all who aren't like, deep in the code base. In fact, typed racket has its own internally two layers. <laughs> syntax parse has its own three layers. And there's a ridiculous 13 layers inside racket base. Um, and that's because the IR is really impoverished. And so as soon as you implement any one thing, you're like, I need to use that in compile time to implement the next thing. So there's a lot of little layers up here. So but it's 20 layers deep, okay? That the module system still has to deal with that and deal with all these dependencies. Okay, so that's the third technical piece. And I'm not explaining how the module system works. You just need to know it does this for you. And it, it, it uses a declarative notation. So here, this is actually a complete file um, in Racket. And because we're using syntax parse at compile time, we need to import the syntax parse library. And you wrap it with this uh, for syntax keyword, and that means that at compile time, we're gonna have the syntax parse library available to us, as well as the basics. And then um, because we need let and if at runtime of this module, we put a require for, for the basics at, um, at runtime, and we just don't require syntax parse at compile time. And so therefore, it's not needed. So the compiled version of this thing, when you, you know, deploy it to the cloud or whatever, it's like, that doesn't need to be in your, in your container, that, the implementation of that library. Um, and of course, this entire file might be loaded at somebody else's compile time via some other for syntax that requires this one. So this might, this is, these are sort of relative numbers. You know, this is like plus one, basically. Okay, okay that's the module system. All right, so here's a recap. The three pieces I tried to explain that, that comprise the sort of basic bones of the modern macro system are we have this driver loop that sort of deals with finding the right thing to do next. We have the data structure that manages scope for us and the module system which manages the dependencies to actually find the transformers. Okay, so let me show you now what we can do with all this stuff. And I got the 10 minute, uh, I got the 10 minute thing, so, uh, okay, I might speed up a little. Um, this program's wrong. Okay, so the origins of Racket are in education. Back in the late 90s, we wanted to teach students introductory programming and discovered, as I mentioned earlier, every professional programming language is just a big mess for uh, first, first time programmers. And it's terribly dispiriting. So this student has very carefully internalized the lesson and put the square brackets in the cond and they've put the weird, this, they did this weird thing here, but then, oh, they forgot. And they, they missed one. Oh, dang it. So, uh, so but Racket's like, okay, cool. I can, no problem, I have no errors for you. You know, if you, if you <laughs> cause it's, a, it's designed for uh, working programmers, you know? And it, you, if you run this code, you're gonna get some message about addition adding functions or something. And you're gonna be like, what are you talking about? So, um, but if you put this in 
the beginning student language. Okay, so you can think of this hash lang thing as basically like it's the first require somehow that sort of gets you started. Find that first library to get the basics of your language in. Uh, now we get a compile time error. And it says, uh, I expected an open paren before a function call. Okay, I can fix that, said the beginning student. You're not talking about plus getting a function. What does that even mean? So how do we get this using the tools that I've showed you so far in the talk? Okay, so this is uh, the, I the powerful idea is that you write a macro that expands into a definition of a macro. Okay. That sounds weird and crazy, but it's actually not that, it's not that complex. So here we have two defines. This is the define from the BSL, the beginning student language. And this is, it's going to compile into a define for the, the full racket programming language. And, uh, but we give it the name actual f here. So of course, this is going to be green. So it's like a private name because it has a new scope that nobody else has stuck on the output of this macro. So, uh, but look what we did with the f. We took the f in the definition and put it into the definition of a new macro. So what we're doing is we're taking the visibility at the moment where define happened in the program and giving ourselves visibility into the moment where the function we're defining is being used at compile time in the program. So this macro now is going to be invoked whenever the student writes f. So we can now use syntax parse takes, you know, we give it two cases. So if we see an identifier by itself, that means it's not being used in the function position of an application expression because it's not being followed, it's not, doesn't come immediately from a, after an open paren. So we'll just call raise syntax error. If, if it is, then we'll, we'll substitute in actual f and just take the, the arguments. Raise syntax error just raises an exception. You know, it's not something special. It's a, a thing every programming language has. It builds a, <laughs> five minutes, it builds a data structure and, and just throws the exception. And you see what it, it puts this STX, which is the syntax object, which has the source location information in it. And that's how Dr. Racket was able to highlight this thing here. Okay. So um, let, me, let me see if I can. Um, okay, so let's take this idea even further. We like to, what's the best way to, you know, the well-studied 80% of the PL research community cares very deeply about signaling errors in programs. And what do they call it? Types. Yeah, that's the best thing ever, signaling errors in programs. We want to stop people working. Woohoo! Okay, yeah, so we got one of those, too, because we, yeah, it's, they're great, okay? Uh, I'm being slightly facetious when I say that. But here, you know, so this, this is typed racket, and it, it's really a type checker. You know, if I delete this call to length here, it's going to tell me something about, you know, I expected a non-negative integer by a list. Well, that's what you expect to go wrong when you take out a call to length, right? Okay. Um, yeah, natural is, a, natural is a synonym for non-negative integer. So it got, the, it got the, the type declaration here, and then this thing returns a list, and so, okay. Um, so how does, how, does this, how does it do this? So if you think about actually implementing this for a moment, you realize that, like, think about the OR macro and think about implementing this. Do you want to come up with a new rule for OR, a new rule for AND, a new rule for COND is it actually a macro, a new rule? It just goes on and on and on. There's all these kind of little macros for which if you just wrote the, use the typing rules on what they expand into, you'd be fine. So that, that local expansion process, typed racket is using that and then uh, type checking the thing it expands into. Hey, I got six minutes. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, 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 okay. Oh, oh my God. Um, so, uh, uh, of course, not every construct, you know, the class system expands into like a vector of method functions and good luck trying to type check that the compilation of a class system and get actual meaningful error messages. So typed racket, had, there's a little bit more support. It can control, it, it, you have a little bit more control than I showed you in this recursive, choose to do a recursive expansion process. But typed racket is using that facility to eliminate, to, to, for software engineering benefit and not having to write out so many type rules all the time. Um, here's Red X. This is a programming language designed to help you avoid errors in PL papers that you write. Um, so what you do is you define a language that's the thing you're studying. So here we've got, it's got, you know, E and tau and some stuff. And then you can, you can, you can give the, you can give a semantics or type system or whatever. You can do syntactic things with your, um, with your language. So like here's the rule for um, typing applications. 
Um, so coming to macros, what, Racket is, uh, what Redux is doing is it's taking defined language and turning it into defined syntax L. But it's not binding L to a transformer. It's binding L to just a pile of information about what's in the language. So for example, if I change this E into like EE, -E, and I run this program, it says, hey, you wrote an underscore before something that's not a non-terminal. And how it knew that was because L had that packet of information, and including, among other things, what the names of the non-terminals are. Okay, so that's one of the that's that's the reason why that environment just maps uh, identifiers to whatever you want to map them to, and you can use defined syntax to not necessarily define a macro transformer, but just to put useful information into the environment, which you can then look up with through other macros. So that's how this information is communicated from this L down to this L. In a totally natural way, right, for the programmer to think, oh yeah, of course, you were, I defined a language L, now I'm, I'm writing this judgment in the language L, so it makes sense to put L there twice. And the macro piggybacks on that. So scope is, using scope as a communication mechanism is very common and uh, comfortable thing to do that the macro system is supporting this way. Uh, this, I really can't explain how turnstile works to you, unfortunately. Um, but I just want to point out how awesome it is. All right, so check out this define typed syntax. So it's like define syntax, and it's taking this idea of the open compiler, and we're going to mix and match cases and do whatever, but it's doing it for the type system instead of the front end compiler. So I, that's maybe all I can say about it. But these are individual rules. It has to be a bidirectional type system, because that's like the algorithm somehow in, in, in those rules. But if you write them like this, you're writing down type rules that you can mix and match and pick up whatever you want, which ones you want, in the same way you can mix and match cases in the compiler when you're you know, using macros to do an open front end. All right. Um, the last thing I'm, I want to say is uh, the, where, where we're hoping to go in the, like, the next five years or so with this is to be able to take these ideas about an open compiler and turn leverage them to get IDE support. And we have some support for this already. So like you've seen these things, kind of like these lines floating around here. I'll show you here. So you've seen these like green stuff and these arrows and whatever. Um, so those, if, I, if, if we fix this program, we're going to get some, some arrows in, in it too. So uh, these, these arrows here in this and, and the arrows in here are coming from the same pile of code. They're both just fully expanding the program and then using that set of scopes you know, thing to determine which things are which, which identifiers are binders and which ones are occurrences of, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in that fully expanded program, getting the source locations of them and then giving it to the GUI in terms of source locations and connections. And then the GUI just takes it from there and when you mouse over it and stuff. And it lets you rename things. And that works completely automatically in these two languages. In RedX, you know, there's like some crazy stuff happening with like, uh, they're somehow going they're somehow going through L down into this L, into this E is how it's finding it somehow. And it's actually kind of worse down here. Like if you look at this E underscore one, this is actually, I didn't get into why, but this is a binding occurrence for this E one. It, like there's a function, it's generating a function internally and whatever, okay. But, but, the, but the E part is, al is also the one up here because, <laughs> because maybe, maybe E is not the name you wanted, you wanted to call it exp, and so you want to rename them all to, to exp. Um, so, so uh, Dr. Racket cannot automatically figure them out here, but there's just a little bit of extra code that the Redux programmer, who may be related to the Dr. Racket programmer, wrote to be able to get this to work. Okay, so think of that now. What if we could do this for an analysis, and then we could have refactoring tools that are backed by this analysis that for the most part just calculates what it needs to calculate on its own, but you could maybe do something sort of in the same spirit of, uh, uh, of, of defined type syntax where you give, uh, as part of your macro, a little bit of information about, oh, yeah, don't, don't, don't try to do your analysis on the expanded form, that's crazy. Here's the rule that you need for this one, because this one's a little bit more complicated. And then we could leverage that and, and, and get, you know, uh, really, really awesome IDE support for all these different programming languages with relatively little effort. Okay, that's where, uh, okay, that's where we try to go next. Yay. All right, okay, so uh, here's the thesis. I would say this is not the best collection of words to necessarily maybe describe what you've seen in this last hour, but okay, hopefully it's a slogan that'll stick with you if you have a better version of it, tell me. And then um, let me just uh, uh, roll some credits here. Um, these, are, these people are authors of those, those papers and then some papers that came after them that are particularly important 
papers in my opinion, particularly important contributors to the, the background behind modern macros. And these are the people who wrote the languages that I, that I showed you. And I just want to call out Sorowi. He's a PhD student at University of Washington whose uh, advisor is Amina Torlak, and he's graduating this year and on the market. So um, he has some constraints in what he can do, but uh, if this stuff seems interesting to you then, um, and you think maybe you have a place for this sort of thing at your institution, then I encourage you to reach out or I'll be happy to introduce you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we run out of time, but maybe there is one question. So we had already a lot of questions during the talks. So you have somebody a question? Okay, so you are the guy with the last question. Uh, if I was writing my own programming language from full scratch, totally greenfield, what I should I do it this way? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I mean, not, you know, I, there's thing. always there's always room for improvement. Totally. And um, uh, so I think that, uh, but I would definitely taking advantage of what's known about how to structure macro systems and putting that into your new greenfield language is uh, that would be a good move. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Maybe I, I for one uh, question, how do how you deal with the other language where you want, do not want to have the parentheses like the Python example? Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so um, I, Racket Dumb does not have a lot to say about parsers, unfortunately. Um, but like Rascal or ADF, SDF, mm -hmm. those people have sort of fantastic sort of parser combination composition tools that you, that those are the best things to look into. But from the racket point of view, what you do is you write the parser that takes your bytes and gives you that initial syntax object where okay. the set of scopes are all empty everywhere, and then you take it from there with the macros. So there's no direct support. Yeah, but, but, but you know, we've got like you know, a Bison clone or something. So, uh, okay, so. Uh, there's one, one more if we. Uh, one more, okay. I don't know so if we. Uh, last one. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to what extent can languages defined this way, like, like you showed several different languages that are basically completely different languages that are built on top of the system. To what extent can they like interoperate with each other? Like, can you import one from another? Yes, and it will do something weird if the semantics, uh, you know, because they're they're compiling into a common language, and so you can you can import them together, and something weird might happen if the invariants of the, the compilers, you know, don't respect each other. There's a very big problem there of how to how to do interoperability well. Have people ever actually managed to use this? to build an interesting and useful program that I mean, you know you, ha of. you have to, I, let's let's I'll say this that racket itself does not offer any direct support for making that work well okay. there there's some intellectual frameworks that are that we have in the research community check out Amal Ahmed's work is a good starting point mm -hmm. um, uh, for how to think about how to do this kind of thing um, but but it you know from here from this point of view it's like you've got two compilers that compile into the same language put them together you know it might do something weird but okay. it might be great <laughs> Okay, thanks again for... Thank you.